The Anna's hummingbird is the only hummingbird that stays in our area all winter. I don't have an image of the female, which is much drabber than either the male or the rufous female. This male rufous hummingbird is displaying to defend his patch of flowering currant, one of the earliest flowers in the spring. The male rufus soars up high and bugles to call mates and then swoops back down to his favorite perch. They make an entirely different sound when they're squabbling over the feeder. The female rufus hummingbird has very different coloring from the male, with a green back and white tail spots, but the rufus sides still make her easy to identify. This image shows the brilliant colors of the female's back and tail when she has a fresh new set of feathers for the breeding season. Here, a rufous female sits on a nest made from lichen and spider webs. She lays two tiny eggs. The spider webs make the nest flexible so it can expand as the chicks grow. By the time the chicks fledge and leave the nest, they have already grown to almost adult size. Here the mom has fed the chick on the right and is standing on its back to reach the other chick. Gold crown kinglets stay in the valley all year round. During the summer, they mostly feed in the upper canopy, but the scarcity of food in winter brings them down to forage closer to the ground. I would not have recognized the identity of this newly fledged chick if I had not seen the adults feeding it. The ruby crown kinglet also stays all year round and generally remains more visible because they forage more at eye level. Note the red patch on the head and the pale wing bars. Males and females look alike, except the females lack the red crown patch. Another identifying field marking for the ruby crown kinglet is the broken white ring bracketing the eye. Male and female red-breasted nuthatches bear the same color markings, but the females tend to look paler, especially on the orangey breast. They often hang upside down like this when foraging. Nuthatches frequently travel down a tree trunk upside down, poking into hollows in the bark looking for hidden insects. While the nuthatches travel down the tree trunks, the brown creepers land near the base and spiral upwards, often finding insects that the nuthatches missed. Brown creepers stay in the valley year-round, and their cryptic coloring gives them excellent camouflage against the bark of the trees where they forage. One autumn, as I watched this little creeper foraging, I heard a merlin, a small hawk, flying overhead, calling. The creeper tucked itself beneath a fold of bark and froze in place for several seconds, hiding from the hawk. This creeper appears to be listening for the movement of insects hidden beneath the bark.
The Buick's wren is easily recognizable by its bold white eyebrow and pale unmarked underside. The Buick's wren is also a year-round bird, but they are much easier to spot in spring when they give away their position by singing. This Buick's wren is searching for insects amongst the winter leaf litter. This young house wren is the only individual of this species I have ever seen. I photographed it in Saskatchewan, but according to the range maps, we do get them in summer on the southern third of Vancouver Island. Marsh wrens are common birds year-round in marshy areas. Their strident, staccato songs make them easy to spot. This male marsh wren is gathering materials to build a nest. The males begin early and build several dummy nests within their territory. Then the females examine their handiwork, choose a mate, and build their own nest. The dummy nests serve as decoys to divert predators away from the home nest. Even a finished marsh wren nest is not easy to spot since it is constructed of the same grasses that surround it. Juvenile birds of any species are easy to identify by the pale, flexible corners on their beaks that allow them to open wide for feeding. This tiny bird looks like a chick, but it is fully adult. The Pacific wren is a subspecies of the winter wren and defends the same territory year-round. The tail cocked up over the back is a typical pose for all wren species. These little singing virtuosos defend their territories aggressively and will approach quite close to try and drive intruders away with their song. This fledgling was fresh out of the nest when I spotted the family of seven darting and flitting through the bushes. This little fellow was the only one curious enough to stop long enough for a quick photo. The American Dipper is unique amongst songbirds. It has the unusual ability to walk and feed underwater, even in a powerful, fast-moving current. The dipper is named for the bobbing motion it makes as it walks along or stands on the rocks. These tiny, plain little birds are just loaded with personality. The females can be distinguished by their pale eyes, while the male's eyes are dark. On the south half of the island, bush tits stay around all year. They are one of the few species where adults will huddle together on a single branch for warmth and comfort. A bush tit nest looks like an old wool sock hung up by the heel, with the eggs and chicks in the toe. Here, a male has just fed his chicks and is exiting the nest. Cedar waxwings are another species that stays through all our seasons. They're easy to identify by their black bandit masks and yellow tail tips. 
Wax wings are named for the red waxy droplets on the ends of the secondary flight feathers of the adults. These droplets are actually dense concentrations of pigments from their diet of fruit. One day in spring, I saw this one bird offer a mouthful of berries to another. I suspect it was mating behavior. He looked so disappointed when she took the gift and just flew away. Note the black mask and the yellow tail tip that mark this as a waxwing and the streaky breast that identifies this rather pale individual as a juvenile. Here is a darker individual that shows a more typical appearance for a juvenile cedar waxwing. These juvenile waxwings are squeezing the juice and pulp out of these berries and discarding the skins. We have no black cap chickadees on Vancouver Island, but they are common and numerous on the lower mainland. Many small birds take this pose when they want to soak up a little sun. Black cap chickadee ranges from coast to coast over much of North America. The chestnut back chickadee is smaller than the black cap and ranges along our BC coast. Males and females look alike. This individual is carving out a nest hole and dumping out the shavings. Chestnut back chickadees stay all winter, foraging through the snow and the rain for seeds and a few winter insects. This chestnut back chickadee with a beak full of worms likely has chicks to feed. Here's another hard working adult with hungry fledglings nearby begging for food. And here it is a fledgling fresh from the nest and begging for food. The yellow corners on the beak and the bit of baby fluff on its head mark this chickadee as a juvenile. The American goldfinch is a common summer bird with a beautiful song. A few goldfinches stay around all winter, but their coats are much duller, and it's hard to tell the males from the females. The female goldfinch might be less eye-catching than the males, but she's still beautiful. And juveniles look very similar. It can be difficult to distinguish between house and purple finches, and both can vary greatly in colouring. On this house finch, note the orange at the base of the tail.
female house finch has a finely, evenly streaked head with no visible eyebrow. I photographed this individual in winter. It may be a juvenile, but I've never seen another so yellow. A faint blush of red on the forehead suggests it might be a male. This is the only purple finch I've ever seen that actually looks purple, but it is an unusually dark individual. This image shows the opposite end of the spectrum, with an unusually pale individual. Note the pale eyebrow that distinguishes the female purple finch from the female house finch. The pale eyebrow line is even more distinct in this individual, busy eating winter berries. This purple finch fledgling is fresh from the nest, the youngest of a brood of five, it's so young, its tail feathers have not yet grown out completely. This juvenile looks like a female, but at this age they all do. The yellow corners on the beak show its youth. The unique beak on crossbills is designed to pry open the scales of evergreen cones while the tongue reaches in and scoops out the seeds. As you can see, the female red crossbill is actually yellow. Crossbills are quite vocal in flight and are almost always seen in flocks. This red crossbill female is feeding on fir cones. On this juvenile red crossbill, note the streaky sides where the adults remain relatively unmarked. It can be very difficult to identify the smaller flycatcher species because they look so much alike. Their calls and species range help to identify them. We don't have alder flycatchers on Vancouver Island, but they do range across much of mainland BC. Pacific slope flycatchers are common in our summer woods, often heard but seldom seen in the thick foliage. This Pacific slope flycatcher has built a nest in the thick, corky bark of a Douglas fir tree. This alert little nestling is almost ready to leave the nest and fly. Another member of the flycatcher family, this is the only wood peewee I've ever managed to photograph. I call these birds not robins because at first their song sounds like a robin but has a different pattern. <coughs> Ex 
except for the beak, the female black-headed grosbeak looks so different from the male, she could easily be mistaken for a different species. Here you see her from behind, showing a brown streaky back, so different from the black and orange of the male. This fledgling, with his tail and flight feathers not quite fully developed, looks very similar to the female, but much paler. And here is the same individual from the front. In March, flocks of evening grosbeaks often migrate through and stop to feed on maple seeds. These two females are having a confrontation at the feeder. Pine grosbeaks are uncommon in our area, but one winter we had a flock spend a few weeks in January feeding on these berries. I didn't see any males among them. Eastern kingbirds are rare on Vancouver Island, but I have seen them twice on the Lower Mainland. We don't have horned larks on Vancouver Island either, but we do occasionally get them in South Central BC. Each winter, a small flock of these beautiful birds spends the season in Alberni Valley. <laughs> 